in the last month and a half, we've had uh, a number of guys at work uh, retire as part of the Hazelwood deal. With, and the government set up a uh, what they call a transition package where older guys and the various power stations put their hand up to retire and they get, and if they were selected, they were successful, they got to retire and, and younger guys from Hazelwood got to take their jobs. So in the last month and a half we've had a, had a number of guys retire. On, on Friday we had five, other guy, five guys leave, uh, including Gloria's husband John was one of them. But because as they drew near to retirement they started to reminisce about the good old days and, and recall how fantastic things were at work and you know, in the good old days and, and, and the various characters. Because people like to talk about the good old days. You know, but often when we're in the good old days they weren't so good. You know, I can imagine in 20 years time we'll, we'll talk about today as the good old days and how fantastic it is. But so people like to talk about the good old days when a man's word was his bond. You know, all they had to do was shake hands and it was a done deal. You, know, you didn't have to get your lawyer to talk to my lawyer and so on. You know, when, when people looked out for one another, you know, if, you, if you're going away, your neighbours knew you were going away and, and they looked after your house and kept an eye on, collected your mail and made sure that there were no strangers loitering around. You know, I remember when I grew up, you know, we knew everybody in the street. We knocked around with everybody. We knew what was going on in everybody's families. Uh, not so anymore in a lot of streets. You know, we're complete strangers in a lot of streets. You know, I don't know everybody in my street. The good old days. But then the world became busy, became legalistic. You know, a, a handshake wasn't a good enough deal. You know, we had to get it in writing. We had to get our lawyers to look at things. People got suspicious of people's motives. <laughs> why, why are you being nice to me? You know what's going on, yeah? And they get suspicious. And then they start demanding what is theirs. That's my right. I, I've burnt that. I deserve that. And they demand what is theirs even when they don't deserve it. And the danger is that sometimes that can creep into the church. And it can creep into our relationship, with not only with one another, but with God. <coughs> you know, we start demanding from God. We start expecting from God. It's my right, God. You know, I've earned that. I've been a good Christian. I've read my Bible every day. You, know, you owe me. I've been here longer. You know? How come they got it and I didn't? You know? oh, God, I've been coming to this church a lot longer than they have. We try and earn God's goodness and grace. God owes me because, or God is punishing me because. You know? We even saw it in the disciples. You know, the disciples got into the argument of, well, who's going to be the greatest, God? Who's your favourite out of all? Who gets to be the greatest? And they, they were starting to, hey, and I'm, I'm sure they would have logically out, well, God, you owe me because I did this for you. So I should be the greatest. But in Romans 12, 2 it says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So the world, the world is often starting to affect the church, whereas it should be the other way around. The church should be affecting the, the world. And we're told in, in that scripture that we're not to be conformed to the world. We're not to think the way the world thinks. We're not to act the way the world acts. We've got to make sure that we transform our, wo our, our mind and our way of thinking in the way that God wants us to do, to have, have the perfect will of God. So the, the world wants to operate out of a contract mindset where both parties enter in to a contract expecting to get something out of it. You know? If I have a contract with Neil, well, I will supply Neil 
services or whatever, and Neil will give me something in return, whether money or, or something else. You know? it's, it's a con contract mindset that we, we, I give and I expect something in return. You know, I used to have a neighbour in Newborough, um, great guy, you know, nice Greek guy, owned a fish and chip shop, best fish and chips in Australia, I reckon. He's gone now. But I could not give him something without getting something in return. You know? You know, back then I had a veggie garden, and you get the heaps of tomatoes. I take a bag of tomatoes over to him and say, look, I've got tomatoes, you can use them for yourself or you can use them in your fish and chip shop, I don't care. Let's hear some tomatoes. And I could guarantee within an, within an hour there'd be a knock at the door and his daughter would be there with a tray of Greek cakes. He'd made his wife cook cakes. Now, I loved it because it was nice. Greek cakes, I love Greek cakes. But I tried to get into his, into his, his understanding that I just wanted to bless him as a neighbour. I had too many tomatoes, I just wanted to give them. I didn't want any in return, but no, nah, he would not accept it. He had that contract mindset. I give you something, I get something in return. So if you give me something, I've got to give you something in return. And that's the way the world operates, okay? If you want something, you've got to give something. You owe me because I did this for you. But God wants us to operate in a covenant mindset because that's the way he operates. The covenant mindset is where both parties enter into something with the expectation of what can I give. Not conditional on receiving anything in return. You know? I'll go into this relationship, I'll give you something, I don't expect anything in return. If I get something, well, so be it. So we have a choice. We can operate in a contract or covenant mindset. We can operate a contract way, the way God, uh, the world operates, or a covenant mindset where the way God operates. So we've often got to examine our motives. Why do we do things? You know, why do we do something nice to bless Steve? Do I do it to get recognition, to get reward? Because I want him to tell everybody that I'm a great guy and I did this for him. We've got to examine ourselves while we do it. Now, human nature to thank, oh, thank, for, for the praise and work you know, I get from somebody, you know. It's good to get praise, but we must make sure that it's not our primary motive. We don't do something to get praise for it. In Matthew 5, 43, it says, You've heard that it said, You shall love your neighbour and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be the sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those that love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? So God's saying there that you have a covenant mindset in that you, you bless people, you, you love people, even if they don't love you in return, even if they don't bless you in return. Because if you only love people if they love you or you only bless somebody if they bless you, then that's a contract. You're only doing it to get something in return. We've got to... And he says the tax collectors do that. Now that. That was the ultimate insult back then because the tax collectors were the, the despised. Now, we don't like the tax man nowadays, but back then they were really despised because they were a lot, most of them were dishonest and ripped people off. So they were very despised. So for him to take that little bit at the end, you know, even the tax collectors have the contract mindset. So God is a is a covenant God, a giving God. So God died for all. Didn't just die for the Christian. Didn't die for just the churchgoers or even the good people. He died for all. In John 3, 16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, 
and whoever believed in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. You know, we, we, we come around the communion table this morning and, and we heard that, you know, even when Jesus was on the cross, in extreme agony, you know, crucifixion was very painful, horrendous death. But even as he hung on the cross, he still had that covenant mindset of, okay, how can I bless this person? How can I bless this person? How can I bless this person? And I'm not expecting anything in return because he wasn't getting any return. They were standing there mocking him. They were ridiculing him. You know, the guy on the cross next to him had blasphemed him and, and mocked him. And that, but he still had a covenant mindset of, okay, I'm going to bless them and I'm getting hate in return, but I'm still going to give love out. He didn't wait until he received something. In fact, he did the opposite. He got unthankful. He got hatred. He got ridicule. But as a covenant God, he continued to give. You know, we can't earn our salvation. We can only receive it. So many people think, well, okay, I'm going to get something from God, I'm going to get salvation from God, so therefore I've got to give something back to him. I'll enter into a contract. So you give me my salvation, I'll earn it, I'll buy it. But you can't earn salvation, you can only receive it. In Ephesians 2, verse 8, it says, by grace you have been saved through faith, and not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. See, when we give a gift, it's a gift. You can't say, okay, I'll give you a gift and expect something in return. Because if I give you a gift and expect something in return, it's not a gift. So we want to make sure that we, we have that mindset, that, that covenant mindset that God wants us to have. See, often we make the mistake of that we say, I, go, I want to be like Christ. And we think, you know, I want to be like Christ. But to show Christ, we need to start thinking like Christ. We've got to be like Christ. We're, we're, we're called to be imitators of Christ, we're called to be ambassadors for Christ, to, to take on his characteristics and be like him. So we know, oh, I, want, I want to be like Christ. But we don't want to give up our old ways. We don't want to give up our old ways of thinking and, and doing. We say, okay, I want to be like Christ, but I want to stay exactly the way I want. I want to think the way I want to think. I don't want to, that's too hard. In Philippians 2, verse 1 to 8, it says, Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, having of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in the loneliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each look out for not only for his own interest but also for the interest of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in the appearance of a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Jesus had the covenant way of thinking of, okay, I am God, but I'm going to put that aside and I'm just going to give, 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 even to the point of death, and I don't expect anything in return. And then we're challenged to have that same mentality, to, to give, be a covenant people, given without expectation. In Romans 12, 1, we're told, it says, I beseech you therefore, my brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We're, we're to be a living sacrifice. You know? When you sacrifice something, 
You lay it on the altar and, and you walk away and you leave it. A living sacrifice. We don't say, okay, I'll, I'll leave it in my will and I'll bless somebody. God's saying, no, okay, a living sacrifice. And sometimes that, that may be a challenge. God may say, okay, I want you to give this up. You know? This person hasn't got it, bless them. Unconditional. <clears throat> I always remember years ago we, we went to a seminar and Richard will remember it. It was a uh, guy by the name of Joseph Gullington, big black guy. Uh, he was a, over from America, big pastor over in America and he come in and spoke at some conference that we are at and he, he was uh, been successful, uh, which we thought was good. I'm a black man in America, highly successful. And God challenged him, said, okay, anything in your house that you have not used in the last six months, give away. A bit of a challenge. If you, you, know, if you haven't worn something or used something in the last six months, give it away. So he did. And then God said to him, as he said, one of the things he had was being a black guy, he had a Mercedes Benz. And he thought he felt good, he said, in the Mercedes Benz, die for those rich white neighbourhoods, black guy, Mercedes Benz. Look at me. Know him. And God said to him, give your car away. And he said, no, I'll give everything away except for uh, the car. But God said, give it away. So in the end he did. And sometimes when God says to us, give something away or, or stop doing something or, or put that on the altar, sometimes it's a test. Sometimes God will say, put it on the altar and then you say, okay, you can have it back. i was just checking you. But sometimes he wants us to put it on the altar and, and walk away. <coughs> and sometimes that's not easy to do because we think, okay, God, I'm going to, Put on the altar, but what am I going to get in return? You know? Am I going to put this on the altar and I'm going to get something better? You know, another couple I knew we had, and I don't, I'm not sure we had, ever had them in, in more, but we had them at the Moe Church, was uh, Ken and Dorothy Gardner. And they were children's ministries. They'd travel around a fair bit. So their van that they had was very important. It was their mode of transport, so the ministry. And they got challenged to give it away. And they said, God, you've got to be joking. It's our ministry. How are we meant to get from point A to point B? So they said, no, well, yeah, we'll be fine. Well, they gave their van away. No expectations, gave it away to somebody. And I got a day or two later, somebody comes knocking on the door and said, we've got the keys to the van. I want to give you that. And they blessed them. So... But they were willing to lay it on the altar and walk away. We're called to be a living sacrifice. So we've got to be willing to lay it down and give it up and not expect God to, to do anything in return, you know, if we're in the covenant thinking. If we're in contract mode, we think, oh God, I'll give that up, but I want something in return. By the way, I'm not telling you guys to give everything away and give it to me or something like that. Look at them. See, for both parties to fully benefit, both parties have to be willing to give, you know, with no expectation of receiving. We have that covenant mind. You know, we need to make a decision right at the start to stay in covenant thinking mode, regardless of the circumstances, the feelings, or the emotions. Because there'll be days where you feel down emotionally. You know, Pam shared a little bit, you know, up and down with, with some of the emotions with, with God. You know, the days where you're down emotionally and, and circumstances will overwhelm you and you think, well, what's the use? I, I give up. You know, Job and David, Elijah, Paul, you know, all these great men in the Bible. 
at, at various times in their, in their walk thought that they'd lost God at various times. But it was only because they had this covenant mindset that they continued to push through and kept on going. Mother Teresa, when she made the decision to, to go into the mission fields and, and to minister to the, the poorest of the poor, made a decision in her heart and her mind that she would have a covenant mindset regardless of what happened. And she said that there was times there where she could not sense God's presence or love. And she thought, where are you, God? But she determined in her heart and in her mind to continue to push into his presence and, and give regardless. She said, even if I can't sense God, even if I can't see God, I'm going to do, I'm going to continue to give and continue to bless. See, covenant should not be conditional on how we feel. So we think because we don't sense that God is here, maybe he's pulled out of the covenant. We think, well, maybe God's not in it anymore. But see, God doesn't withdraw from us when we don't do. He said he would never leave us nor forsake us. We need to constantly examine ourselves to make sure that we stay in covenant mode, in a covenant mindset. It's so easy to start off in a covenant mode and slip into the contract mode. But the best way to stay in the covenant mode is to hang around covenant people, hang around in God's presence. You know, there's an old saying, that you want to be more generous in your life? Hang around with generous people. Catch what they've got. Want to be more covenant thinking? Hang around with covenant thinking people. In Hebrews 10.25 it tells us to fellowship with fellow believers, the body of Christ. Don't forsake it. You know, make sure you get the air. It's not to, to make church look good with the numbers, with, oh, we've got a big crowd here. No, it's so that we rub off on each other and, and our, our mindset affects each other, you know. You know, hang around with, with believers, you catch what they've got and, and help each other. You know, the world is legalistic, self-centred, demanding what is theirs and operates for a contract mindset. So we're always going to make sure that we, that we examine ourselves to stay in that con, uh, covenant mode. As I said, it's so easy to, to start off and you know, go, oh, I'm going to be in covenant mode and I'm going to bless I'm going to bless Joe. I want to bless her. And I started with the right mode. But she didn't react the way I wanted her to react. She didn't get all excited about what I gave her. And she might have even got a little bit uh, standoffish. And, and suddenly I've slipped from covenant mode in the contract mode. Yeah? I blessed her and she should have Bless me back, or you know, how and we see how easy it can be sometimes to slip from one mode to the other. We've got to make sure that we stay in covenant mode. And you know, you know, I'm going to bless Joe. If she gets excited about it, good. If she doesn't, well, okay, well, it's her choice. You know, we always need to make sure that we don't slip in the contract mode. We want to, as I said before, we want to be covenant-minded people that hang around with a covenant God. Because when we hang around God, when we seek God, we see how he operates. You know? And that was part of the discipleship of, that Jesus had you know, with the disciples. They, they sat at his feet and they watched how he interacted and responded to people. And, and at first... They struggled with it because they were in contract mode still, okay? Because they'd seen how the Pharisees operated and, and how the religious people operated. And so every time they, they saw Jesus in a situation, at first they expected him to be in contract mode. Okay, I'll give, so I got something back. But as I watched him and observed him, they saw he was in covenant mode all the time. He was always giving, he was always blessing, he never turned people away. And the result of them hanging around with him was in the end they become covenant people as well. So we need to seek God. 
God's not hiding. That's a good thing. You know? Often we think, well, I can't see God. I can't hear God. God's not here. But it's often because we're too busy or too distracted to see him. So we've got to make the effort sometimes to stop, focus and look for him. In Hebrews 6, uh, 11, 6, it says, Without faith it is impossible to please him, for, who, for he who comes to God must first believe that he is, that he is a reward of those who diligently seek him. Deuteronomy 4, 29 says, Seek the Lord your God and you will find him. If you seek him with all your heart and with all your soul. And Proverbs 8, 17 says, I love those who love me, and those that seek me diligently will find me. And in Luke 11, 9 it says, so, so I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find it. Knock and it will be open to you. So God's not hiding, but we've got to look for him. We've got to take the time and, and the world can consume us. We can get so busy, busy, busy with stuff that we haven't got time for God. We haven't got time to to um, sit down and, and just do nothing except for focus on God. You know, I've said it before, we, we get caught up in the instant of the world. You know, we want instant this, instant that. You know, I pray to God, I want instant response. I, I, I do this for God, I want instant results. But we need to just focus on God, take time out, you know, and there's various ways and, uh, you know, you guys are wise enough to know, you know, that there's many ways in focusing on, on God, you know, one, one is his written word, his word. God's written word is the Bible and, and as we, we delve into the Bible, we read the Bible, God communicates his heart's desire, giving us insight into his character, through his life story, his loves, his hates, he gives us instruction and advice. We get to see, as we read, read the scriptures, we get to see the mind of God in action. And that's why we need to read our Bibles, because God speaks to us through his word. In 2 Timothy 3, 16, it says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for any good work. In Joshua 1 8, Joshua was told they need to meditate on the, the book of the Lord, the word of God. You know, the Apostle Paul, when he was he was praying for Timothy, the, the young pastor of the church, said in, in 1 Timothy 4, 13, he says, Till I come, give attention to reading, to exhortation, to doctrine. Do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy with laying out in the hands of the eldership. Meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them that your progress may be evident. Now, Paul was saying to Timothy, you know, you, you've got a gift, you've got a call on, I've laid, and prayed, laid hands on you and prayed for you, you know, but you've got to get into the word, you've got to meditate on it, spend time with God so that we can see the growth in you. And, 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 and that growth would have been in a lot of it in the mind of the way he thought, you know, he would have become more God focused and more God centered and more he, he would be seeing things through God's eyes and he he'd becoming a, a covenant person of okay, I'm gonna give, I'm gonna bless without expecting to receive. Now one of the keys with with my my scripture reading is you know before I before I start reading the Bible, I'll, I'll pray and I'll ask the, the Holy Spirit to give me revelation. You know, okay, God, give me fresh revelation. Show me something in this scripture I'm going to read. Show me something you know, that I've never seen before. You know, and often I'll, I'll read a passage in, in one translation and I'll read it in a different translation to see or, or do a word study. Or a, a good thing is, is to sit and, and have a discussion. You know? That's why small groups are good where you can read a bit of scripture and okay, what did that say to you and, and, and pull it apart and, and have a discussion around the word of God. You know, we, we get caught up in the, in the busy, busy world that we don't have time to have quiet time, to have a meditation. In Psalm 4, 4 it says, be, 
Be angry and do not sin. Meditate within your heart on your bed and be still. In Psalm 46, 10 it says, Be still and know that I am God, and I will be exalted among the nations, I will be exalted in the earth. In 1 Kings 19, when, when Elijah had, had um, done those great things, he'd taken on all the prophets of Baal and he defeated them and, and, and they'd done the... When he previously had built the altar, they built an altar and who God was better and naturally Elijah's God was the best. he came come down and consumed it and then killed all the prophets of Baal. But then... I think he, he slipped in the contract mode of, okay, God, I've done this great thing for you, therefore you're going to do something great for me. But then he heard that Jezebel was going to come and kill him, so he ran and he fled and he hid. Because he thought God basically had pulled out of the covenant. And then God came and spoke to him in a small, still voice. So we, we often think it's hard for little children to sit still. But it can also be hard for adults to sit still, to still themselves. And that's where we need to have the discipline in ourselves to say, okay, I'm going to still myself, I'm going to spend time in quiet time with God. We need to take time to stop being busy and quiet ourselves before God, to hear him about the distraction of everything else. Not always easy. You, know. you think, okay, I'm going to spend time with God, quiet time. And I guarantee you, usually the phone will ring or somebody will come around and visit. Or you're spending time, you know, in, uh, into a minute of your quiet time, you think something pops in your mind. Oh, yeah, I've got to do that. So I'll do that. And we can get distracted. But, but it takes discipline, you know. We, we learn and, and you try and build on it. And you might. We only able to do it for one minute and then you build on it and then it grows to two minutes and five minutes and, and suddenly you, you think, okay, it's five minutes up and you realise that half an hour has gone by. Quite on. This guy I used to know, his quiet time was going to the laundry, crawling against the, the dryer, turned the dryer on so it made a racket and he was able to have his quiet time there. Um, now... I don't know how he did it, but the noise of the dryer going stopped all the other distractions in his mind. He was able to focus on God. Another time we, we find God is, is, is praise and worship. You know, we come here as a church and we praise and worship God in songs. You know, and it was great to have Daniel and, and um, Karen and, and um, Susanna. Uh, there's leaders in worship and it, it's a time where, uh, where it should be a covenant opportunity where we, we, we give to God not expecting anything in return, you know. And often we can get in the mindset, we come here and you start worshiping and you ah, this ain't working, you know, it's, I'm not getting anything out of it. But we're not to get, meant to get anything out of it. We're meant to be given. And I always remember Nancy Harkin same, you know, she, she would go to a meeting and, and everybody in the row was dead. She had to stand there like limp lettuces singing, just going for the motions. And she think, well, I could catch what they've got, or I could get going. And, and if I get going, then the person next to me might get going, and, and, and it would usually work. To praise and worship is an opportunity for us to come and give to God, to bless him, to praise him and worship him. So the word praying comes from the root word which means to pray to God, to move towards, to worship, to supplicate, to will. It's communion with God. We focus on God when we pray. We come face to face. In other words, it's talking to and hearing from God, focusing on God, giving him all our attention. You know? When we worship God, we should be given full attention to him. We shouldn't be worried about what's going on and, and sometimes it can be challenging at times because there's stuff going on around us, particularly if you've got little kids. It's a bit hard to focus on God and keep an eye on what your child is doing. But 
we should be in covenant mode of, okay, I'm going to bless God with my praise and worship and I'm not expecting anything in return. You know? But God being God, when we give him praise and worship, it does something in our spirit and we get something there in return. We feel good. It's praise God. There's so many other ways. You, know, you guys have probably got different techniques of, 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 of coming into God's presence. You know? Some people like to go for a walk and, and just see God's beauty in creation and, and feel God's presence in that. Others like music and noise. They've got to have noise. They've got to have you know, a bit of worship blaring out in the house to come in God's presence. What you've got to do is find what works for you and do it. As long as you do it regularly and come in his presence. Because as we spend time with God, then we become God-minded in our actions and our thoughts. As we spend time with God, we see that he is a God of grace, a God of love. You know, we, we see that he doesn't do anything out of um, selfish ambitions. You know, he doesn't say, okay, I'll love you because it makes me look good. I'll be nice to you, I'll bless you because it makes me look good. No, he's a covenant-given God. He so I go, I've got this covenant mindset. I will give regardless. I don't expect anything in return. It's good if you can, you know, but I'm not going to be... You know, it would have been so easy for Jesus to stand on that cross, you know, go in, and, in the covenant mindset, get on that cross, and then say, well, no, nah, it's not worth it. You guys haven't learnt. You're still mocking me. You're still ridiculing me. No, I'll sleep in the contract mode. But he didn't. See, if we operate the way God operates, we see a God of grace, a God of love, if we operate in grace and love at all times, as God does, then we'll be covenant people like God and not contract people, which the world tries to transform us into. Yeah? <clears throat> you know, people in the world struggle that you're a covenant person. On, yeah, but what are you getting out of it? And they can't understand that you're not going into something to get something out of it. You go into it to give. <coughs> you know, nine times out of ten, you'll often get something back in return, but it doesn't matter. But the world says, nah, you, you, you're going to do that for them, and they're going to do something in return. Whereas we're not to be like that. So I'm going to end with a scripture I've already read a couple of times. Romans 12, verse 1, it says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that you may be proved what is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. We have a covenant God, a covenant-minded God, and God wants us to be covenant people as well, not be of the world.